And also we, are, uh, we have uh, Tony from NGA in this room. So any questions you want to ask about NGA and were too afraid to ask before, you can ask now. Not that he will answer everything, but. So, okay, so let me get started on the first question because we want to break at 2.15 and have a little break. <clears throat> uh, in the areas, uh, this is changes in water management strategies over time. In the areas of severe groundwater depletion, what steps may be taken to manage groundwater, including recharge? So uh, this is commenting saying a school of minds. Um, I don't think this is an answer to this question, but I think that I'm going to share it anyway. Which is the the idea that we we have parts of our, like parts of the way that we function right now um, are Im important to have as water stores in cases of severe depletion. So I think the fact that we like water our lawns in the Western United States, for instance, isn't a bad thing because that provides a store of water when things get really really terrible. So I think this idea of uh, patterns of human behavior that already exist maybe are less terrible than we think when we think about severe groundwater depletion and potentially using those as stores in the future. Any other comments? Yeah. yeah, I guess maybe I should be more clear because I, th I think if we if we were better at water conservation, we would use that water for something else. Oh. I guess is maybe what I mean. Yeah, so I mean, just to follow up on what Kamini was saying, I think it's like um, the story with irrigation that we've increased irrigation efficiency a lot over years, but we've actually just been increasing crop yields then. We're still using a lot of water for irrigation it's not like then we've had all of that water left over so i think like the issue of demand hardening that's like a really good one to bring up of like maybe it is good that we have some inefficiencies and slop in our systems that when we're really in trouble we can let our lawns die Go ahead. Um, so, uh, sorry, I just stepped in, so I apologize if you said this already, but, um, you know, changing the types of crops that are grown, right? I mean, that's one of the obvious steps, and it's not always easy. I mean, people have their preferences, and, and there's also considerations of what's, you know, farmers are going to think about f probably first off, what, what crop can I get the most value for? But, um, but mm -hmm. in situations where there's, uh, where there's a limited amount of water, then, then um, you know, probably not a great place to, to grow, you know, rice or something like that. You, you think about less crop, less uh, water intensive crops. So. A vincat. I'm looking at the questions here, one second. Okay, I mean, the bottom line is you just reduce pumping. That's, that's all you've got to do. And you can do that and still be economically viable. I mean, there's an example of this, and I, I keep uh, having to draw upon the Kansas experience because I think it's educational for guys like you. Um, and Sheridan 6 Local Enhanced Management Area is a 256-square-kilometer area in northwestern Kansas where they have reduced over the last six to seven years on average, the water use by about uh, correcting for climatic conditions about 29%. And they're still making just as much money because they're shifting crop types, they're using water when the plants need it because they're adopting strategies of precision agriculture, they're looking at the soil moisture, et cetera. So there's a lot can be done in terms of, uh, of that aspect that we need to, uh, to focus on. So, so, so can I say, over here, uh, improve irrigation efficiency? 
No, our experience with improving uh, irrigation efficiency is, um, you know, it's like the uh, natural resource economists have known since like the 1850s with Jevons paradox. Uh, doing that oftentimes actually leads to increase in water use. But in Kansas, we have a cap because of the water rights, so we, we can't increase the use. But folks find use for that. They either start mm -hmm. uh, growing more water-thirsty crops or they irrigate larger land areas. So, 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 so change the crop to match the biome. Yeah, I mean, you've got to challenge folks. I mean, you've got to take them out of the comfort zone. This is not agriculture painting by the numbers, but, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. uh, irrigation community it can be highly adaptable, and they just uh, need to understand the long-term ramifications of current behavior. Okay. Okay. Tony, please. Uh, yeah, this isn't my, my personal example. It's just one I've seen at uh, AGU, an uh, uh, example of an uh, economic uh, co-op uh, to share water rights for uh, different crop types, uh, high-value crops uh, versus uh, more staple crops in Latin America somewhere. Uh, but uh, they, they basically uh, set up an economic system where they would transfer um, uh, water rights from the low value crops to the high value crops in those dry years and so setting up those economic exchanges uh, but that comes with uh, some type of a local agreement to do that to be successful so, okay can I say there's another thing that talking you know with the people of the war bank is like making sure that you know the land they, they are not effectively you know irrigated or they're not productive for proportionally to the irrigation amount they maybe get, you know, so maybe limit or, you know, reduce maybe the portion of, you know, farm area to mm -hmm. have only the efficient one or reduce the inefficient portion. Yeah, I think along the lines of the, what, the last two comments were that it's like it's more than educating people on unsustainable behavior because I think most people like in the high plains know that we have groundwater declines it's that we don't always have the right economic policies in place that actually incentivize people to do what's in their best long-term interests or we might be incentivizing crop choices and crop and patterns that are the opposite of what we actually want so i think it's like partially better monitoring so people can see like the Kansas example is great because they're actually like really keeping track of it and they can see when they've had success and then so it's like two things so people can see that there's a problem and see when they have success but then there's also economic policies in place that at least don't incentivize them to do the opposite how about reuse so, for example, mm. recycled wastewater or artificial groundwater recharge, for example? Yeah, I think it's the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, and recycle. So, <laughs> yeah, so. Can I add another thing here, which is uh, looking to success stories? So, the, the obvious example, I think, is uh, Israel, where they, you know, they yeah. do amazing amount with a very little amount of water so you know replicating the practices that they have and the policies is, is um, you know definitely the smart way to go I was gonna add to recharge just coming up with intelligent ways to recharge um, so like online canals I think people may have mentioned earlier but that that's one of the most efficient ways to recharge really large areas but then also finding areas that have high enough permeability and connections to the aquifers that we're trying to recharge so we know that the water is actually going where we want it to go. Uh, the other thing I was thinking of, this has come up before in some of the other discussions, but um, you know, obviously we can't manage what we can't measure, right? And so um, when Jim was talking about every pump in Kansas having a meter on it, um, I think part of being able to manage groundwater is actually knowing what people are using. So that idea of, of metering more broadly our use seems like a worthwhile step. Better, better monitoring. Better monitoring. Better, better monitoring, yeah. Okay, let's jump to number two. We can circle back if we need in the end. What remote sensing technologies and modeling capabilities can be used to 
identify and track water management approaches being used. I mean, INSAR is used for this, right? People have used INSAR for this for a while, right? Fine. Yes. Uh, so in, INSAR is always tricky because it's giving us mostly what's happening in the confined aquifer. So like in the High Plains aquifer, it's INSAR, I-N-S-A-R. Um, in the High Plains aquifer, they're pumping tons of groundwater, but there's almost no subsidence signal. So it's, it really depends on the area, but, but it's definitely uh, something that can be used and is used often. Yeah, maybe good clarification to say INSAR and confined aquifers, maybe. I was also going to mention soil moisture. So if you have an area where where they are not over irrigating their crops, you could you'll see that soil moisture decline during the during the growing season. In our session yesterday, someone was mentioning is that when you have a strategy to manage a groundwater problem, people usually advertise it quite well. So we do know it. Do, we do know about it. But what be, can become interesting is actually monitoring whether that whether that's working or not. Because I think there's a lot of management strategies that have backfired in many ways, or that we're not we were not able of uh, making it stop. Uh, especially for the large cities, uh, we knew about depletion a long time and that kept on growing. So. I think that's, that might be a good way. And irrigation efficiency, that has been heavily documented for, I think, 20 years with really, really detailed numbers that it doesn't work and people are still talking about it as a solution. Explain to me again uh, how irrigation efficiency does not work. What happens? It's the behavior of humans. So you save up more water, so you're going to use it to extend your field. So that's why, I mean, Kansas has imposed caps on withdrawals, and that's a beautiful example that is quite well documented. Uh, the FAO has also an extended report that documents all of the strategies that were implemented, case studies of irrigation efficiency strategies implementing, and they try to review that in a neutral way. I really encourage you to read the report. I think the, the language is very interesting. There's no good examples. So that's a bit of the limit of using the Israel model. I think there's a lot more to learn from it, and people tend to read it at a, a very superficial level. Same thing with the, the Netherlands initiatives. Yes, it could work in Israel because there's not too much place to extend their agriculture. But in Kansas, it can't because it, they can go forever. So I guess, I mean, the land area, it's well, edible, it, it, edible it, land area. It, 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 also. More efficient techniques have to be coupled with policies like, you know, limit, limiting the amount of water that's being used. It, and, and they're growing high, high dollar uh, produce that they then, uh, you know, fly off to the markets all over the world. They got the proximity to international airport. That really helps. Netherlands, the same thing, that they can grow this stuff. When you're more aerially broader, it becomes more of a challenge to use some of those techniques. Any other contribution to number two? Okay. So now we come to the two last questions and Tony can give us a little bit more insight. Thank you, Tony, for coming here. He, he volunteered. He volunteered. So it was very kind of him. I was pressure, peer pressured into it. No. Yes, sir. Um, so the, the, let me read the question out. So with regard to identifying and interpreting changes in water management strategies, where could NGA resources be leveraged to advance this work? Uh, so I'll, I'll provide kind of the same background that I was uh, trying to give everybody else in the other uh, the other breakout sessions. So if you, I know a couple of you were in those, uh, and so this will be a little bit of a, of a repeat. But when we talk about uh, NGA resources, what we're thinking about is uh, really there's kind of three pieces of the pie. Remember, the main part, uh, uh, the main customer that we have is the is the warfighter and the policymaker. Uh, so we're uh, so. Uh, really looking uh, to inform them. So there's three things that go into being able to inform them. Uh, one is just the data. Is there data available? So the question, uh, one question that comes to resources is, 
is there better data sets that you can recommend or collection or things that you can re recommend that we might be able to contribute to uh, in terms of better data? Uh, the models or uh, technologies to then use that data would be the next step, right? So can we, uh, are the models sufficient and all you really need is the data, then we might focus more on the data. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you're, uh, if you say you might have good data, you might have good models, good sensors, then the next thing would be how do we take that information and make it easier for the uh, policymakers and the warfighter to use? So those are building the tools. So it's essentially a data uh, model sensor, you know, monitoring uh, capability, and then the tools to make that accessible uh, to the end user. Those are the three things that we're re really kind of focus on when we're talking about um, where we might put resources. So if you can kind of think it and frame it from that perspective, where are the gaps that might, uh, you know, we might be able to leverage your expertise to for us to identify and move towards? Lauren. I think for policymakers, what's really interesting and with respect to groundwater is the food energy, food, food energy water nexus. Um, because there's actually a lot of the time groundwater is the victim of food security or energy security considerations. Uh, typically food security would be privileged over the levels of depletion. So you see that in many countries. That's also the reason for insurance scheme, the farm bill policy, or these sort of things where to help people out to get food or out of poverty that you have groundwater depletion that was induced. And for energy security, it goes a bit along the same way, where you make energy freely available, and that depletes greatly uh, your groundwater resources. We see that in Iran, we see that in India, we see that in uh, several countries. So now I think that's where it's really interesting to put a focus on the policy uh, side of that aspect. I think in terms of modeling, it's really hard to do, because we talked about all of the challenges to aggregate the water data together to make this sort of modeling happening at the correct scale that informs really these policies. But when you switch to the food, energy, and water nexus, you have to aggregate the same information across the two other dimensions too. So uh, it's a big challenge. There's a lot of necessity in terms of data, cyber infrastructure, data integration, data assimilation, uh, a whole research agenda here, I think. Any more contribution to? For you guys online, the question was, what is the role of NGA in accomplishing that? Um, uh, really, when it comes to us, our uh, our goal is to advise the policymaker. So, from it comes to a policy side, we don't we don't take any we don't make any policy uh, decisions or uh, statements. There, our goal is to provide the best information available. Uh, to those policymakers. So in, in, our, in essence, what we're trying to do is translate science in a way that's understandable. Uh, so uh, our role uh, is essentially that, is, is, is taking that science and communicating. So science communication is, is kind of what we're looking at when it comes to this. So the, the question was, would NGA be the repository uh, for some type of uh, data like this? Uh, I would uh, probably argue against that NGA be the sole repository. Uh, we do have, uh, we do work with other uh, government agencies and international partners to do uh, data uh, curation stuff, but typically we don't uh, store those uh, uh, for public use. And so uh, what we would have to do is uh, identify some type of partner. So we may, uh, we may partner with somebody where they would start, uh, store it and we might provide uh, some funds uh, for that, some of that initially, or we might work directly with one other government agency who does that uh, type of work. But we may, we ne not necessarily gonna do, uh, we're not gonna provide data openly to the public. That's not gonna happen. Uh, and kind of, I mentioned uh, from the last uh, kind of summary uh, statement that, uh, one of the things that we're not really good at is communicating what uh, data that we do have that we could use to help advance some of these uh, tools for things uh, like uh, these agreements that we have. Because in order for us to share a lot of uh, the uh, information that we do have, we have to come in some type of agreement to do so. Um, with um, 
with these uh, uh, agreements, uh, a lot of the reason for that is a lot of these uh, un these unclassified data sets that we're getting are uh, commercially derived, and a lot of those uh, have license use restrictions uh, that typically uh, require us to have government purposes uh, in order to share it. So if we want to uh, share it, we have to show that there's some benefit to NGA. So that's where why we get into some of these restrictions and why we don't share so openly. I know this is a, a rough to ask on the very last day, Tony, but um, so is NGA um, generally also then a repository of data sort of internally for its own use rather than a generator of data? We do generate uh, data uh, and repository. We do have both of those functions, uh, but when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, sharing that data, typically it's with U.S. government partners. That's kind of where the restriction okay. typically is. But you guys are actually collecting data on some of these satellites, not just um, sort of contracting that out to someone else. And um. uh, So if it's a, the commercial satellites and stuff, we're not responsible for those. Th those we would be purchasing the data. So, for example, like the Planet Labs, uh, Digital Globe, we have contracts with them to get that commercial data, but we aren't necessarily uh, hosting that data. Those providers are, but we have access to it. Carly, you had some question from online. Um, does, uh, this is for Tony. Um, do you know about any behavioral, for example, consumption habits study or database for the U.S. or global rural and urban areas? So I will first uh, emphasize that as an intelligence uh, community member, we do not look at the United States So uh, without direct uh, request from another government agency. So to make that clear, we are not looking at the U.S. Um, uh, when it comes to repositories of data, um, this is part of the reason we have this workshop is to identify those some of those data gaps and be able to um, uh, uh, be able to bring that together because uh, all of this information is going to be uh, society benefit uh, benefit society, right? Not just uh, NGA, because uh, our customer again is going to be the the warfighter and the uh, and the policymaker. And what we're really interested in is making sure that they have the best uh, available information. In, in that case, uh, it's going to be coming and looking at the community itself to provide some of that data. One thing that came to to mind for me in, in terms of identifying and interpreting changes in water management strategies that, that could be useful is some some global study of like in what regions of the world will will this certain method work and in what regions will this other method work because as you know there's limits to all these different methods in terms of spatial resolution in terms of what aquifers they tend to work for so kind of some uh, fairly comprehensive study looking at, at where they're likely to work. And of course, it, you wouldn't know in some cases until going in, but, but based on the, the data that are available. Okay, uh, I think we're reaching to the point of 2.15. So I'll go to the last question and I'll encourage Tony to provide as much input as he can. What are some examples of successful collaboration opportunities and what are the promising partnerships that could help advance our understanding. Tony, do you have any insights how NGA has partnered with other people, especially in the hydrologic and you know, water and groundwater spheres? So uh, I'm not sure how much detail I can go into. I can speak to international partnerships that may not necessarily be related directly to hydrology. Um, we, we do have uh, work with uh, international agreements for things like um, the currently the TANMX uh, project. So that's the uh, global, uh, uh, a global elevation data set that where we uh, do work internationally with partners. We do train, um, you know, uh, international scientists to produce uh, these uh, basically elevation products to our standards. So we have high standards uh, uh, for these products. We. Uh, work with the uh, the German gov uh, government and that, uh, because they're uh, it's, it's a German private German company. Just if you're not familiar with the data, so it's a private German uh, company that's providing the data. Uh, but uh, NGA has an, a, a use agreement to be able to uh, basically we help process the data 
and provide, uh, provide that data back to them, and then we were able to uh, keep that data and use that for, uh, again, U.S. government purposes. Uh, the issue, again, with sharing that type of data is that it's always, it's license, right, so license restrictions, um, but we do have that data. If you're able to join us uh, with a CRADA or a, a NURI or a NARP, then there's a possibility you might be able to get access to this. Um, but in that, when I say that, it's still being processed. It's not being complete. So there's, it's uh, definitely uh, very dirty in terms of uh, noise in that currently. Any other inputs, please? Questions, but not for the last one. Sure, to please. The floor. please. Um, I was wondering if anyone knew of groundwater management strategy to fight depletion, but looking at land use, so not uh, increase aquifer recharge, interact. So green infrastructure in cities happen. But I was wondering if you knew of you know multi crops or fighting deforestation or any sort of actions like this that would fight that would try to mitigate uh, or increase recharge that way. You know, one of the one of the most uh, widely used land surface model is SWAT, not SWAT, but SWAT, uh, and they look at different land use. It's it's the jack of all trades. It's a USDA collaborate collaboration produced model. I do not know how much they do for recharge estimate. I know it's not coupled to a groundwater model. Jim, correct me if I'm wrong. If you know this. Uh, SW80, soil water assessment tool. But I guess you could do it and see uh, how the recharge improves when you change the crop type or, you know, uh, change it back to forest cover. I mean, it's supposed to be working on HRUs, huh? Modern versions of SWAT have a lower uh, concept. Yeah, but not an entire groundwater aquifer. <laughs> Can I ask another question then? So we talked about groundwater quantity, but we didn't talk about groundwater quality. And I think depletion in many occurrence, I mean, the, typically the case of arsenic in Bangladesh, is that depletion led to more arsenic. Uh, does anyone know of uh, strategies that were implemented to fight that issue? So coupled effect of quantity, quantity depletion and uh, impact on quality. So, so you mean specifically using like manipulating groundwater flows to improve water quality versus like in situ treatment or something like that? Is that what you're asking about? Oh, it was just to fill the gap that oh. we didn't speak about quality aspects. Oh, I see what you mean. So I was wondering if you wanted oh, to contribute okay. on that part because we had quite a few talks about Bangladesh, for instance, mm -hmm. but it could be any other issues. I guess if I paraphrase your question, how does the land, uh, the ma water management strategies help to improve water quality? Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know yeah. the answer to it. Well, and I think a, another example uh, would be like salinity in the Central Valley where our irrigation choices, whether we're doing like drip irrigation or flood irrigation, um, can influence a lot how salinity is building up in the soil and the potential for that salinity to flush deeper and contaminate groundwater so that's the example that comes to my, my mind in terms of like your crop choice and land cover choices and how that could affect quality and then of course like fertilizer application and stuff like that yeah. and there are many instances where they inject near the coast to keep out seawater intrusion that's a fairly popular management strategy and uh, as far as you know other types of heavy metal type contamination possibilities you don't have to go very far to see them you know, in in much of the Piedmont, you have, uh, not, I mean, in, in many cases, you have problems with uh, hexavalent chromium contamination, which again, very similar to arsenic, it's related to how oxic the conditions are under the ground. And any type of groundwater depletion will make the conditions more oxic and, you know, allow hexavalent chromium to start migrating. So it, it's a fairly widespread problem. Uh, and only when it gets to very hot spot type conditions does it receive the kind of attention that, you know, merits some kind of mitigation treatment, that, that, that type of operation. I think we should take our break and come back in 15 minutes refreshed. <laughs> 